A few people in the comments section of my recent videos about the whole situation at FTX are acting like these videos are designed to be funny or that they're comedy of some sort. And that's just not true. And it's a mischaracterization of my YouTube channel and everything that I'm trying to do here. Today, I'm going to be talking about the venture capital firms that invested in FTX. And so to a certain extent, I have to rely on one of the documents from Sequoia, one of the big tech VC firms' websites that they've since deleted. This document explains the thought process around their investment, which they were clearly very proud of only a few weeks ago. Now look, there's stuff in there like the bit where SPF pitched to the partners that his vision for FTX was of a super app. You can buy a banana, you can do anything you want with your money, Sam allegedly said to them while dressed like an unruly toddler and playing video games. But that's not a joke, it's just what happened. It's in the document and it was deemed relevant by the partners at Sequoia as otherwise they wouldn't have publicized it on their own website. And we're not going to learn much about technology venture capital investing here if people are just going to snicker about things like this in the comment section of my videos. In California, particularly in Silicon Valley, Online cryptocurrency trading and banana procurement are the kind of problems that still need to be solved. And to many in the venture capital space, Sam Bankman-Fried looked like the man who would solve that problem. This banana statement from Sam apparently blew the partners away. The document goes on to explain that what Sequoia was reacting to wasn't just the idea of getting a banana, it was the scale of SBF's vision. This wasn't a story about how we might use fintech in the future or crypto or a new kind of bank. It was a vision about the future of money itself with a total addressable market of every person on the entire planet. That's what they say. And that is really the thing. A crypto brokerage might have a market that's capped at a certain size. There's only so many people interested in trading cryptocurrencies and wealthy enough to trade cryptocurrencies. But almost everyone on the planet would consider eating a banana. And it's not just people either. Monkeys love bananas. And for all we know, maybe a monkey would happily give you a Bitcoin, which is worth around $16,000, for a banana because monkeys have no use for bitcoins and they love bananas. Sam was singing the VC investors a song they wanted to hear and he was doing it while playing video games. I think we can all agree that in truth the partners had the wool pulled over their eyes by Sam, who at no point appears to have transacted in bananas after taking their investment and we don't yet know if any monkeys have found themselves facing financial hardship after opening accounts at FTX. The press just aren't talking about that. So anyhow, like I said, this is a serious video. And if you think it's funny, you just don't understand how things work in Silicon Valley. And that is your fault, not mine, as I've been doing my best to explain it. Now, before we go any further, let me tell you about today's video sponsor, Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that helps you understand the most important ideas in over 5,500 non-fiction books in around 15 minutes each. You can either read them or play the audio on your phone. The best thing is that it's not just book summaries. The Blinks are put together in an interesting and engaging manner. They extract the most important concepts, making the books fun, interesting and digestible. With Blinkist, you can listen to lots of new books while you commute. And I quite like using it as a way to refresh my memory of books that I've already read. They have a new feature called Blinkist Connect, which allows every Blinkist premium plan to be shared by two different accounts at no additional cost. If you find yourself traveling a lot over the holiday season, this is a great app to have on your phone. Click the link in the description to start your seven day free trial and get 25% off a premium membership. Okay, so according to Sam, what happened next at FTX was a simple $8 billion mistake. 
There's been no real explanation as to what exactly happened with the customer funds that have gone missing. The closest thing to an explanation that we've seen is a tweet from Sam saying that the issue stemmed from a poor internal labeling of bank-related accounts. Now, of course, if that was the case, I would imagine that some quick relabeling could have occurred and then everything would have been fine. But a relabeling solution is starting to look less and less likely right now, as many of the FTX employees have reportedly fled the Bahamas, some even abandoning their cars at the airport. And that's the thing with Gen Z, a bit of labeling work turns up and suddenly there's no one to be found. But anyhow. Now, of course, while people do make $8 billion mistakes all the time, it's likely that we're instead looking at a huge fraud. The bankruptcy filings state that the company's management used software to conceal the misuse of customer funds. That on its own is fairly damning. While it's totally reasonable for Sam to have lost his own money and the money of the VC investors, there's no reason that customer funds were ever touched. Sam appears to have invested in Robinhood and in Twitter. Money was spent on sponsorships given to politicians. Money was invested into the very VC funds that invested in FTX. Shouldn't the venture capital investors have considered it a bit strange that Sam had enough money to invest with them, but was asking them to invest in his firm? $300 $300 million worth of real estate was bought by FTX, which was used as homes and vacation properties for FTX executives. Sam's parents, two college professors, bought property in the Bahamas worth $121 million. On top of all of this, Sam bought a Toyota Corolla to demonstrate how humble he is. So which venture capital firms invested in FTX and why? Well, Tiger Global, as an example, was an early investor. They first invested in FTX in a Series A round in 2019, which raised $8 million. Tiger would later go on to invest in two more rounds. Others in the Series A included Lightspeed Venture Partners, Temasek and Binance Labs. Oh yeah, and of course there was SoftBank too. After raising $8 million in 2019, the pandemic struck in 2020 and people stayed at home and traded cryptocurrencies. By July 2021, in a much hotter market, FTX was able to raise a billion dollars, with additional brand name investors including Third Point Ventures, Coinbase Ventures and Thoma Bravo. Orlando Bravo, the founder, had been a student of Sam's father's at Stanford and was excited to invest with his professor's son. In October 2021, FTX raised a meme round of $420 million from 69 investors. Both of those numbers are considered lucky in Silicon Valley. This capital raise valued the firm at $24.5 billion. Tiger Global was in that round, as was Lightspeed, Temasek and Senator Investment Group, along with dozens of others. It wasn't just sophisticated investors who put their money in either. Kevin O'Leary invested too. The most recent fundraising round occurred in January of this year, as crypto had already begun its fall. The $500 million Series C, which valued FTX at $32.5 billion, included investors like SoftBank, Lux Capital, Tiger Global, Lightspeed and Temasek, among others. Now that FTX has filed for bankruptcy, these investments appear to be entirely gone. Many of the investors have marked their holdings in the company to zero. These investors will be stuck facing tough questions from their investors about how they missed all of the red flags. They'll have to explain why they didn't demand board seats and what exactly their analysis involved. Over the last year, we've seen that it's not just retail investors who experience FOMO. The Financial Times interviewed a few VC investors who didn't give their names. One claimed to have been seduced. He said that, with hindsight, he thinks that when his firm questioned SBF before investing, they should have focused more on the details about the crypto exchange's governance and financial controls. 
rather than being blinded by its founder's snowballing celebrity profile. He went on to say that he had some reservations during initial calls with SBF, including the way Sam comported himself and the sense that Sam believed everyone else in the financial world were idiots. Another venture capitalist said that due diligence did not reveal the high levels of leverage in the business. He claimed that investors were only shown the balance sheet at quarter end and the leverage was not on it. It is normal for VC investors to ask for a seat on a portfolio company's board in order to monitor their investment and to have some control. But at FTX, none of the investors had board representation. The three-person board of FTX consisted of Sam Bankman-Fried, Jonathan Cheeseman, a former FTX executive, and Arthur Thomas, a lawyer in Antigua, who specializes in online gaming. With startup investments, VC firms are often most worried about a product failing. They give a founder a lot of money to build out a business, and the risk is that the founder either builds a product that doesn't work or that there's no market for. VCs are used to dealing with businesses that might have sloppy accounting and bad governance, as that's often the nature of investing in startups. But often the VC firm brings this type of professionalism to the table. They put their own people on the board and get financial reporting in order in time for the company to go public. Tiger Global, who I mentioned was one of the first investors in FTX, had a reputation for being a founder-friendly investor who moved fast and did less due diligence than other investors. They reportedly closed one new investment per day last year. Tiger hired the consulting company Bain & Company to do due diligence on FTX. In fact, Bloomberg reports that Tiger pays Bain more than $100 million a year to do research like this for them. According to a number of investors, Sam Bankman-Fried's pitch to investors was not much of a pitch. It was a take-it-or-leave-it offer. The New York Times reports that the pitch was that FTX was Sam's company and he planned to run it with little oversight and interested investors should support him and observe. One investor apparently asked Sam to put together a presentation. The presentation was allegedly thrown together in PowerPoint in a few hours. There was no formatting, the fonts were all mixed up. The story goes that the investors were a bit uncomfortable that so little effort had been put into explaining the business, but they invested anyhow. Andreessen Horowitz was one of the big VC firms that did pass on investing in FTX, in part because its partners didn't trust Sam. Elon Musk claimed that he turned down an investment in Twitter from Sam as he had an instinct that something was wrong about him. Based on statements in the bankruptcy filing, it now appears that this may be untrue and that Sam owns a $100 million stake in Twitter. For years, VC investors have been reducing their standards and stripping away requirements that give them control over a company and protect their investment. This is what they say they have to do to get into the hottest deals. And there's an argument that you might not be making the best investments in such situations. We have in recent years seen venture capital firms get excited about investing in firms like WeWork, where they somehow got confused that a co-working space with a beer tap was a technology startup. Last year's investment manias in cryptocurrencies, tech stocks and the SPAC boom only intensified this trend. Venture capital investors viewed FTX as a way to dip a toe into cryptocurrency without buying risky coins or tokens, the idea being to invest in the casino rather than gamble at the tables. They often viewed FTX as a safer bet than Binance since FTX had pushed to establish some sort of regulatory regime in Washington, while Binance had drawn controversy by dodging financial regulations around the world. So how bad is the performance at these funds? 
Well, it's difficult to say, as a lot depends on their overall portfolios. They will have invested in all sorts of other startup firms that are difficult to value. It's probably a good guess that they're not doing that well, as public tech stocks and unprofitable companies have not been having a great 2022. So it's reasonable to assume that their overall portfolios might be correlated to an index like Goldman Sachs's non-profitable tech index. But it's important to realize that they won't be wiped out by their losses in FTX. Venture capital is actually designed to take big risks that often fail. Sequoia, an early backer of Google, PayPal, and WhatsApp, had $210 million invested in FTX. They went on to become Sam Bankman-Fried's biggest cheerleader. That position made up less than 3% of just one of their funds. Other VC funds will have had similarly low allocations to FTX. So while you might read about them losing large dollar amounts and being victims of this fraud, the loss is usually a small percentage of their overall portfolios. One issue is that these high-profile investors gave a certain respectability to FTX, a respectability that it didn't deserve based on the way it was being run and the lack of supervision by these name brand investors. FTX customers are likely to have lost significantly higher percentages of their wealth when the firm collapsed two weeks ago than the venture capital funds did. FTX marketed to retail investors that they should have their paychecks directly deposited into their FTX account. This would have been a disaster for anyone who followed that advice. Because of the collapse of FTX, there is still no super app where you can buy a banana and you can do anything you want with your money. Who knows what wonders the future might bring, though? If you have a great idea for an app like that, do let me know about it in the comment section. And I don't want anyone making jokes down there this week. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch my video on Blitzscaling next, which looks at how startups like Uber and WeWork can set VC money on fire while trying to grow. Don't forget to check out Blinkist, our video sponsor, using the link in the description below. Have a great week and talk to you again soon. Bye.